Peace to the 12. Y'all see the title. I'm probably going to make this like a playlist. And I'm going to call it like Page of Proof or something. Where I just get one page of a book that I've read. Of proving our identity. And y'all see the title. It says a bishop talks about African Jewish customs in the 1800s. You know. Even though I don't even really like using that particular word. But let's get into it. So this bishop's name was William Taylor. He was an American writer. Bishop William Taylor, he was a minister, he was in a missionary methods. Uh, William Taylor was an American missionary bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church, elected in 1884. Taylor University, a Christian college in Indiana, carries his name, right? So he wrote a book called The Flaming Torch in Darkest Africa. I repeat that, The Flaming Torch in Darkest Africa. We're going to go to page 331. And after I read this page, I'm going to get some scriptures, and then we're going to get up out of here and on to the next one, all right? So, this is page 331 of The Flaming Torch in Darkest Africa by Bishop William Taylor. It says, The discoveries of the ruins of ancient walled cities whose treasures of art and science belong to a civilization that had nothing in common with their present surroundings bear mute testimony to the commercial influence and military glory once their own. So in many of the tribal customs of Africa, there are traces of the introduction and observance of forms of revealed religion, antedating the Christian era. There probably were missionaries of the Jewish dispensation whose proselytes were scattered over the entire length and breadth of the continent. No, there were Israelites that were scattered over the breadth of the continent. You can read the scripture that tells you about the rivers of Ethiopia, uh, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia which would be in West and Central Interior. Then you can read about the Lord says he's going to pull us out of Cush and from Pathros and from Elam and from Shinar. You can also read about how there was uh, Israelite settlements in Egypt. You can read about that in Maccabees as well as in uh, for, uh, Matthew, the second chapter, I believe, when uh, Joseph flees into Egypt. But anyway, I should have included those scriptures, but all that just came to mind. Y'all can look it up. But um, where was that? The customs to this day of some of the tribes of living in booths constructed from the branches. Now, remind you, he's talking about these so-called Africans. The custom to this day of some of the tribes of living in booths constructed from the branches of trees at a certain season of the year, observing the ceremonies identical with those of the children of Israel. Yeah, that booth he's talking about, you can read about that in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse... Uh, 40, Leviticus 23 and 40. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees. Doesn't that sound like what he said? Living in booths, branches of trees, right? Ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord, Yahweh your God, seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord, Yahweh, seven days in the year. It shall be a statue forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. All right. So going back to this book where he talked about the custom of them being in booths with from the branches of trees identical. Now let's continue on. Um, the liberation of a cock in the wilderness to carry away the transgressions of the people. And he means like a chicken, all right? Not like, you know what I'm talking about, all right? Like a chicken. Um, and I can get that as well, or a bird, so to speak. Um, let's get that in Leviticus 14 and 6. Oh, so like you. Yeah, yeah, it's Leviticus 14 and 6. Um, we're going to start at 4, Leviticus 14 and 4. Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed, two birds alive, and clean and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over run of water. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the run of water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that it is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. Let the living bird loose in the open field. Going back to here, the liberation of the bird in the wilderness to carry away the transgressions of the people. 
There's also uh, another Levitical uh, law where it talks about the uh, scapegoat. You can look that one up. I didn't include it, but you can look that one up. Um, then there's the practice of circumcision. The practice of circumcision so general among the Zulus seemed to link them with the period following the Exodus. Right? The period following the Exodus. The law of circumcision, Genesis 17. Or this isn't even a law. This is when it was first introduced uh, with the covenant of Abraham, Genesis 17 and 10. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, which would be the Israelites. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in a house or brought with money or any stranger which is not of thy seed. So that's dealing with circumcision. But he mentioned that the Zulus went to the practice. All right. The traditional history of Abyssinia connects it with that of the Jews thousands of years before Christ. All right. When it records the visit of Queen of Sheba to King Solomon. All right. And, the, and even to this day, you know, have something known as Beta Israel, also known as Beta Israel, the Abyssinian uh, Judeans or the Abyssinian Jews, what they call them. Right. And the, you can read about the account of the Queen of Sheba in First Chronicles the 10th chapter, but I'm just going to get first, excuse me, I'm at first Kings, the 10th chapter, and I'm just going to get verse 13, but you can read the whole chapter for the account. A King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty, so she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. All right, and they have record of that, according to the this text, the Queen of Sheba, all right? Uh... It was at the time of rich, populous, and powerful state, and is the only portion of Africa, save Egypt, that maintained this type of civilization through the ages. Well, Egypt has been um, taken by other inhabitants. I'll just say that. But like I said, I'm gonna keep this brief. I'm gonna call it, make this playlist. I'm gonna call it a page of proof or something like that. Page of proof, and I'm gonna get one page from a book documenting our Israelite heritage. And with that. I say peace to the twelve. I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to the Heavenly Father, the Most High, Yahweh. In the name of His only begotten Son, Yahweh Shai. Yahweh is the name of the Heavenly Father, who is commonly known as God, Yahweh Shai, the Savior of the nation of Israel, who is commonly known as Jesus Christ. I want to say shalom, which means peace to you people listening and learning. You brothers doing this work, truth, and sincerity, and you elders for doing this thing before me. Go ahead and get up out of here, man. Not even going to be too long. Peace.